Finding God. That's an idea that maybe some of us struggle with. How can I find God? Where can I find God? But what if we don't, in fact, find God? What if he is revealed to us? Get this. The Greek word epiphino means to reveal or to appear. Well, that's also where we get the word epiphany. But we're not talking about that light bulb moment that is revealed in our heads. We're talking about God revealing himself to us. Think about it this way. We need God to appear to us and make himself known to us. His works and his ways are just beyond our understanding as humans. In fact, they're contrary to our natural assumptions of him. And this means we can't possibly discover the truths about God ourselves, but rather they need to be uncovered and appear to us through his word, the Bible. Salvation has appeared physically here on earth in the person of Jesus Christ when he came into this world on Christmas. So in this season of Epiphany, let's dig into God's word together that the surprising truths about Jesus our King and life in his kingdom are uncovered. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, fellow children of God. When we walk into a movie theater, or maybe start a movie in our living room, we expect by the end of the movie that we're going to hear some good news. I mean, a lot of times throughout the movie, the hero faces all sorts of challenges, and sometimes it seems like those challenges are just too hard to overcome. And yet, by the end of the movie, the hero comes out on top. The villain is defeated. The crisis is averted. The guy or gal finds their true love. And after all that has happened, after the big problem has been resolved, the implication is that, well, now that this problem is gone, there's nothing else to worry about. Or in other words, at the end of the movie, it says they simply live happily ever after. 
However, we don't we know that that's really not the way it goes, is it? There are challenges that we all face every day. And when we overcome one challenge, we think, well, okay, thank you, Lord, for giving us the strength, the courage, for giving us all that we need to overcome this challenge. But more often than not, there's another challenge that's just right around the corner. As the years go by, do we face less problems or more problems? But of course, that shouldn't really surprise us because we know that as long as we're living in the sinful world, there will be challenges that we face. And as Peter told others who were early believers and, and looking at the challenges they faced, he said to them, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And yet the comfort and the confidence that we have is that no matter what we face, no matter what challenges tomorrow brings, we have a good shepherd who continues to watch over us. We have a fortress, an unmovable word upon which we can stand. We have our Lord in which we can always trust. And that was also true for the fellow believers who lived during the time of our scripture reading for this morning. After Jesus completed the work of salvation, we may think that, well, because Jesus showed his power by leaving the empty tomb behind, there wouldn't be anyone who would question his authority anymore. We may think that after the Holy Spirit made that special appearance on the day of Pentecost, everyone would want to hear the good news and put their trust in the one true God. But of course that didn't happen. Even after Jesus completed the work of salvation, even after God had given that special gift of the Holy Spirit, there were plenty who still opposed the message about Jesus Christ and all that he would accomplish. And as we look at our scripture reading for this morning, we see that that's what happened. And in response, the believers, well, they turned to the Lord. They knew that the opposition was coming, and so they turned to the Lord and they prayed to him for the strength and boldness they needed to continue to proclaim his message. And so also, as we look at our lesson, we, we join with them to pray, Lord, continue to display your power to your people. Do this as you have done in the past to accomplish your purpose, and do this so that your word may be proclaimed. Well, we turn once again to our second lesson for this morning, Acts chapter 4. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, and you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why did the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Now, right at the beginning of our lesson, it says that Peter and John had just been released. They had been detained. They had been arrested. And what was their big cry? Had they spray painted the graffiti all over the high priest's house? No, that wasn't it. Had they started a revolt or a riot in the city? No, they didn't do that either. All this started because of a simple act of kindness. One day, Peter and John were headed to the temple courts, where many of the Israelites would go to worship. And as they were headed to the temple courts, they walked past this man who had been crippled from birth. 
But that day was special for this man because on that day, God did something incredible for him. We read in Acts chapter 3, then Peter said to this man, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. That man would come and sit at the temple courts daily so that he could beg for food or, or for a little bit of money, just enough to survive. But on that day, God gave him his life back. He enabled him to stand up and, and walk. And when that happened, when, when people saw this man that they had seen over and over again for years, and they knew who he was, they knew he had been crippled, and all of a sudden he's up and walking around, well, people started to take notice. They wanted to see what had happened. They wanted to know how it had happened. And as Peter saw people gathering around him, he, he saw an opportunity. He took the time to tell them about Jesus. He took them the time to tell them how Jesus had cured this man. And not only that, not only how Jesus had done this incredible thing for this man who had been crippled his whole life, but he also took the opportunity to tell them about the incredible thing that Jesus had done for them. How he had sacrificed himself and how he had risen victorious. And when the people started gathering around Peter and John, when people started to hear that message, the religious leaders came out. They, they wanted to see what was going on too. But they didn't come out just to hear what Peter or John had to say. Instead, they saw the threat. What were these people saying? What were they doing? Were they... Were they forming a riot? Were they proclaiming something different than what they had expected? And so just like they had oppressed Jesus, they arrested Peter and John and, and they started to question them. Now, it might have been easy for those disciples to back down and change their story in the face of this opposition. I mean, these were the leaders in Israel. But instead of backing down and changing their story. In fact, they doubled down. And right there in front of those religious leaders, Peter proclaimed, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. They didn't change their story, but in fact, they boldly proclaimed that message of Jesus Christ and all that he had accomplished and all that he could accomplish. Now the religious leaders wanted to get rid of him. Just like they had gotten rid of Jesus, they wanted to get rid of the people who were proclaiming that message about Jesus, but at the same time, they knew that the people, the crowds, wouldn't stand for it. So what could they do? Well, they scolded Peter and John. They said, all right, don't talk about Jesus anymore. And they finally released them. And that's what we get to our scripture reading for this morning. Peter and John have just been given a, a stern talking to by the leaders in Israel. They had gone back to the, their fellow believers. And notice how they react. They didn't cower in fear. They didn't go and hide. They didn't say, all right, how are we going to change our message? But instead, they put their trust in the Lord. And, and in fact, the opposition that they faced was something that they had expected, right? Because they had seen the same thing happen with Jesus, and they remembered what Jesus had said to them. He had said, no servant is greater than his master, and so if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They knew it wasn't anything strange or different that they were facing. Instead, it was what God said would come. And then they also remembered that God could even use the intentions of evil men to accomplish his good purpose. And that's what brought these believers back to the Psalm of David that's quoted in our scripture reading for this morning. 
Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? They take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed one. Now, in a sense, that's almost originally fulfilled in David's life. David had been anointed to be the next king in Israel. And yet there were enemies from within Israel and kingdoms from the outside of Israel that continued to fight against him. But the Lord always came out on top. But this psalm has its ultimate fulfill fulfillment in Jesus. Because you see, that term Christ, that means the anointed one. Jesus is the Lord's anointed. He's the one who was anointed to establish an entirely new type of kingdom. And yet, earthly rulers saw him as a threat to their authority, and so they wanted to get rid of Jesus. And perhaps they thought they had won the victory when they finally saw Jesus crucified and breathed his last and his lifeless body put in the tomb. The nations conspired against the Lord and against his anointed one. And yet, a little bit later, the psalm also says, But the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. The Lord even used their evil intentions to accomplish his good purpose. Because even those, those who opposed Jesus thought they might have won the victory by seeing Jesus' lifeless body laid in the tomb. The only reason that the Son of God died was that because he willingly offered himself as a sacrifice of atonement. The only reason that Jesus suffered as he did was because that was all part of God's plan of salvation for you and for me. And then God proved that. He proved that was all part of his plan by displaying his authority, by taking that lifeless body that had been laid in the tomb and bringing it back to life. As we read in Acts 2, God raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Our Lord Jesus proclaimed his victory and he proclaimed the kingdom that he had come to establish. And just as the Lord had used the evil intentions of men to accomplish the work of salvation, the believers now prayed that he would continue to do that same thing. And notice, once again, they didn't pray that their enemies would drop dead. They didn't pray that the challenges would all of a sudden disappear. Instead, they prayed for strength and boldness to proclaim the gospel of God, even in the midst of this opposition. And that's the same thing that we pray for today. Because we know that God and his word is so often opposed in our world today. Think of how many people want to get rid of the idea of Jesus or the name of God altogether. Not too long ago, there was a rather famous scientist who said, you know, if parents want to believe in, in the Bible and creation and all that type of stuff, that's fine, but just don't teach that to your kids. And, and basically, it's thought is, we're beyond that. That's foolishness. And, and on top of that, there are plenty of places in this world where believers are physically persecuted by threat of law and even by the threat of death. And that has been the case throughout history. And, and even though we might not face those same types of threats today, God has never promised that it, that type of threat wouldn't come. And then at the same time, there are a lot of times when there are more subtle challenges to our faith, where we're tempted to compromise the Word of God, to change the Word of God, just to make people happy, just to make it fit into our society a little bit more. But part of the reason for this may be that believing in Jesus means that we have to admit that we're sinners who need a Savior. And a big chunk of the world, and probably even a little bit of our own human nature, says we don't want to be accountable to anyone, much less an almighty God. 
And on top of this, people are tempted, well, like you mentioned before, to, to change God's word, to, to modify it just a little bit so that God can look a little bit more like us. And all these are challenges to our faith. All these are temptations for us to, to give up on that firm foundation that God has provided for us. And, and Paul warned Timothy about this. He said, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. There are attempts that our own human nature is tempted to change or modify God's word because our human nature determines it is out of date. But then again, this opposition doesn't come as a surprise because it's the same thing that happened to God's Old Testament believers. It's the same thing that happened to Jesus. It's the same thing that happened to the believers in our scripture reading for this morning. And when this opposition comes, we pray the same thing that they did. We pray that God would give us strength to go back to his word, to go back to his promises, to go back and see how precious every syllable of the gospel is. And then we pray for the strength to proclaim this word boldly. Not to compromise it, but to proclaim it boldly. And we do that because we know that that gospel about Jesus Christ and all that he has accomplished for us is the one way that God has given us to bring people from the darkness of sin to the light of salvation. That gospel message is the thing that leads us to see our God as he truly is a loving God who sent his son to die for us. That gospel is the one thing that can change hearts and minds and, and welcome people into God's kingdom as as. Peter also says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And as we turn to the Lord for that strength and for that boldness, as we put our lives in our God's hands and as we trust in him to provide what we need to hold on to that gospel and hold it out as the light of salvation, we know that our God will continue to bless us. And just as the Holy Spirit gave that house a little shake to let the believers know that he was there, God continues to fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit through that gospel message. And as we proclaim that message boldly, as God has also promised, it will not return empty, but will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. And so... Just as our Lord has done in the past, he will continue to strengthen us so that we can live as his people. Just as the Lord has used all of history to accomplish the work of his salvation, he continues to use all things for our eternal good, for the good of his church, and for the good of the gospel. As Paul also encourages us, and God placed all things under Christ, that is his anointed feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. And may this grace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. With all your might, Christ is your strength and Christ your light. Lay hold on life and it shall be your joy and crown eternally. Run the straight race through God's good grace. Lift up your eyes and seek His face Life with its way before us lies Christ is the path and Christ the prize Cast care aside, lean on your guide His bound.
Nor fear, his arms are near.